Hello, this is Matt Burns from the University of Missouri. We're going to continue our conversation today about RTI within a core instruction within RTI without good tier one, nothing else matters. I want to start this by talk, talking about a school I worked with many years ago. And it was a school in a different state that had started, I was working with it to implement RTI model, it was an elementary school. And they were, saw about 60% of their kids pass the state test. And they started, they, I, I of course started working with them talking about tier one and PLCs, et cetera, which was the subject of the previous video. And they, the, they um, started adopting this model called uh, the Minnesota Reading Corps. They got the news that they're going to be accepted for it. It's a really great model. It's funded by AmeriCorps. And basically someone comes in, these trained tutors come in, implement these one-on-one -on -one reading interventions for kids. And it's great. And the principal called me and said, this is great. We got approved for reading corps. Can that be our tier two intervention? I said, yes, absolutely. Sounds great. But I kept trying to push them to still think about core instruction in tier one. And the following year, remember this number of kids who passed the state test was 60%. They got the test results back. And the number of kids who passed the state test went from 60% to 63%. And the principal was devastated by it. And he called me, he was really upset. And I said, well, you know, I, I thought to myself, I didn't say, I thought to myself, he didn't listen to me. So let's go back and let's really focus on core instruction. And they did, looking at PLCs and through interventions I'm about to show you now. In the next year, the number of kids who passed the state test went from 63% to 78%. And then never got dropped below 80% after that. We implemented several things, one of which is a reading intervention at tier one. I've already shown you math intervention at tier one. Now I'm gonna show you the reading intervention at tier one when we see a class-wide need. So again, just reminding you that the primary problem analysis question for tier one is, is there a class-wide need? The primary problem analysis question for tier two is, what's the category of the need? And the primary problem analysis question for tier three is, what's the causal variable? Again, that environmental variable we can manipulate that's most closely related to the problem. So today we're talking about class-wide need. And I've already mentioned this, you get PLCs, they meet uh, hopefully once a week, but certainly no less than every other week. And then in September, January, and May, they look at the screening data to answer these questions. Is there a class-wide need? Who needs tier two? Do we miss anyone? What should we do for tier two? And should we go to tier three? So the first question I'm now gonna talk about is class-wide need. In the previous video, we talked about math tier two. I showed you how to identify a class-wide need. If the class median is below the criterion. So once again, just to review, here's a group of students in the second grade, the class median is 87. Any kid scoring below, 91 words per minute, this is Ames Web measure, 91 words per minute needs a tier two intervention. So when we see there's 12 out of 23 kids need a tier two intervention, we compute the class median. That median is 87. If the class median is below the criterion of 91, in this case, we have a class wide need. I'll skip this. Um, I went over this previously. What's, what is the class median? It's just the middle score. You just rank order the kids. If there's an even number, you take the two middle scores, take the average of those two scores. So between 60 and 64, the class median is 62. Okay, when we see a class-wide need, we start a class-wide intervention. Now, there's great ones that already exist. The PALS program from University of, uh, from Vanderbilt University is fabulous. Uh, it's on the What Works Clearinghouse as an evidence-based intervention. I highly recommend it. We use it a lot. I use a lot with kindergarten and high school. Now, Elementary school, we, we had this grant. I, I may have mentioned it previously. We got this grant from Target Corporation. And Target was wonderful. They're great to work with, and they, they gave us money to develop this intervention. So we started running tier two interventions. And it, I had tons of money. They gave us several million dollars. And so we developed this program, and I had 24 research assistants. The, the project with Jennifer McComas out of special ed and Lori Hellman out of curriculum instruction and myself at the University of Minnesota. We had this wonderful program, and we had this fabulous resource. So three of us headed it, and we had 24 research assistants from, you know, mostly PhD and, and EDS students from school psych, special ed, and curriculum instruction. And so we would just, if we saw a class I said, showed you a second ago, where 12 out of 23 kids need an intervention, fine. We had 24 RAs. Go do it. We just went and ran the interventions. What we found was, after doing this for weeks, 
the winter benchmark, yes, during the intervention, all the kids did great. Their progress monitoring data looked fabulous. But the number of kids who scored in the proficient range didn't go up on the screener. So we panicked. So we went and bought PALS. And we bought PALS and we took the, the kindergarten, first grade, second through sixth. So we took the kindergarten PALS to the kindergarten teachers and said, here, please do this. And the kindergarten, kindergarten teachers said, yes, great, we'll do it. Sounds awesome. And they did. And they liked it. I've had similar success with the high school program as well. There's a middle school program as well. But first through fifth grade, they really resisted it. They didn't want to give us, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes a day for 26 weeks. So we had a panic moment, went back to our uh, offices and said, what really matters in PALS? How can we shrink this intervention down? And we said, what really matters is the partner reading and paragraph shrinking. So we're going to take all of PALS and just make it those two things. So it'll take 20 minutes a day. So what we did was, in essence, looks like this. We each kid, after they get their scores, we put the kids in dyads. So each classroom has a series of dyads. Now, we don't take the lowest of the low and put them with the highest of the highest. We don't fo fold it like they, you know, we, we slide it like they do in pails. So take the lowest of the low and put them with the lowest of the high. So student A would be matched with student K. The second student who's the second lowest of the low with the second lowest of the high, so student B and student L. And then finally, the, the highest of the high, with the, the highest of the low, student J with the highest of the high, student U. So each team got, each kid got put in a dyad. And every dyad had a folder. On that folder, or in that folder was a, um, several things. Number one, there were, there were uh, uh, rules, basic rules, which I'm going to jump ahead, which is this. There are rules where it says, talk only to your partner, only about reading, keep your voice low, help your partner, try your best. Okay, so that was in, in the folder. We also gave them what was called a standard error correction. I'll show you that in just a minute. But also in the folder was a bunch of passages written at reader two's instructional level. So here we have a dyad, student A and student K. Reader one was always, always, always the better reader. So on the folder, we have written dyad A, dyad B, dyad whatever, dyad whatever you want to name, I don't care, team, whatever. And then it would say reader one and say student K, whatever the kid's name is. Reader two would be student A, whatever the kid's name is. The next dyad, next team, team lion, whatever you want to call it. That would be reader one, student L, reader two, student B. Reader one was always, always, always the better reader. And we'd say, okay, kids, partner reading time. And so the kids, reader one, they knew their job was to get up and go get the folder. And again, in that folder were the rules, the standard error correction procedures, and then and one, one side of the folder was a whole bunch of passages written at reader two's instructional level. And reader, uh, we got the passages mostly from readworks, readworks.org. Let me stop sharing for just a second here. And go here. I'm going to pull, pull up readworks.org so you can see it. It'll take me a second to log in because I've already been logged out. So you have to sign up for it. It's a pain, and you have to give it, um, you know, give me your email and such. So they might send you advertisements or things, but really it's pretty simple and it's all free. All right, so I'm going to go back and reshare my screen. That's coming up. Let's stop the right screen. I'm going to stop sharing, share again. There, that should do it. There we go. Okay, so now you see readworks.org. What's so great about it, and here you see the address, readworks.org. Um, you just log in, and then you can look at the passages, thousands of passages. So if I wanted to look at nonfiction or fiction, if I want to look at a particular Lexile range. So what we tend to do is that most of the schools we worked with use some sort of measure that gives them a Lexile range. STAR, MAP, measures of academic progress, even AmesWeb and FastBridge now give Lexile ranges. So we would, all we would do is limit this. Let's say we, we would try and find passages written at Reader 2's instructional level. So Reader 2 might be a Lexile, let's say 200. 
So we would just do like 150 to 250. There. And we just limit it to that, we see there's tons of passages. So we go through and pick a few and print them. We had to print them. I'll just open one of the Liberty Bell. And you see here, it's a little, a brief passage. That's kind of a short one, so probably wouldn't use that one. I like to find ones with a little bit more words than that. <clears throat> like for example, it looks like this one has 426 words. That's a little better, yeah. And you can print it as a PDF. And we just put a whole bunch of those in the, the folder, but again, written at Reader 2's instructional level. So again, you can sort this by type of passage, by topic, by grade level, by Lexile. If you want to just science passages, you could do that. You want to do life science, etc. Okay. Super easy to use, all for free. So I'm going to stop share now and reshare. Okay, so we put the kids in dyads. Reader one is student K and reader two is student A. Reader one is student U and reader two is student J. Then K kids partner reading time. Reader one knows their job is to go pick up the folder. They sit down, take out the first passage. It's written at reader two's instructional level. So reader one should have no problem reading it. Reader one always, always, always goes first. We tell the kids just, just because that way you have a, a, a job, there's no, no discussing it. Reader one, your job is to get the folder, sit down, you read first, reader two, read second, and reader two at the end puts the folder away. All right, so every kid is in a dyad. Okay, kids, part in your reading time. Reader one goes and picks it up. Reader two comes and uh, starts. So let me walk you through what we actually do. So the first five minutes, I'm actually going back to this screen. It's the better one. Yeah. So, so they sit down, K okay, kids partner reading time to get the folder. Reader one sits down. Reader one reads the passage out loud for five minutes. They read along as reader two follows along. And we usually have a timer. The teacher says, okay, kids, time to start. Reader one, you go first, begin. Read for five minutes. Then once the five minutes is up, reader two goes and reads the exact same passage again. So they, they reread what they just, what reader one just read. This is fluency building. This is, this is repeated reading, basically. So they read it again. So reader one reads out loud, reader two follows along, then we switch, then reader two reads the same thing out loud for five more minutes, so up to 10 minutes. I skip this thing where they sequence the major events. I don't, don't worry about that. So this just takes about 10 minutes. Then, once that's done, okay kids, now it's time for paragraph shrinking. For, I'll show you what this is in more detail in just a minute. So we do five minutes, reader one, five minutes, reader two, same thing. Now, okay kids, part, paragraph shrinking time, so reader one reads again. But now they pick up where they left off. Now it's a new passage or a new text. So if the reader one and reader two read the first three paragraphs for, let's say reader one reads paragraphs one, two, and three. Okay, kids, time to stop. Reader two, your turn. Reader two will read paragraphs one, two, and three again. Okay, kids, reader one, your turn again. For per Don't forget to paragraph shrink. Now reader one reads again, but now they start with paragraph four. And after every paragraph, they stop and read and do paragraph shrinking. Again, I'll show you that in just a second. And let's say during those five minutes, the reader one reads paragraphs four, five, and six. Okay, kids, stop. Time to switch. Reader two, your turn. Your turn. Now, reader two, as I said, reader one read paragraphs four, five, and six. Reader two would pick up with paragraph seven and read for five minutes. So in the first part of it, it's repeated reading. They read the same thing again. In the second part, it's comprehension. So the focus, since focus on comprehension has to all be novel text. Paragraph shrinking looks like this. So as the kid reads out loud, they finish reading the paragraph, they have to tell the most important who or what. Then they have to tell the most important thing about that who or what and say the main idea in 10 words or less. So for example, let's say I would read a paragraph and I would say, okay, this is who's the most important who or what? The most important who or what is Thomas Jefferson. I'm sorry, Thomas Edison. What's the most important thing about that who or what? Well, Thomas Edison grew up on a farm. He didn't like living on a farm. He wanted to work in machines. So you have to see all that in 10 words or less. So we literally teach the kids to put their fingers down for every word. And when they say 10 words, they have to stop. So, okay, Thomas Edison didn't like farming. He liked working with machines. 10 words, they stop. Okay. Now, a lot of kids struggle with this. You have to really have them practice it, model it. We model it pretty much every single time for about three or four times. And even then, there'll be a couple of kids who struggle with it, especially the younger kids. 
I really push you to get your kids to do this. Paragraph shrinking really, really, really is important. It's the comprehension side of it, and we really want to push our kids to do that. So the way we do it is day one, we put the kids in dyads, teach them how to get their folders, okay, par partner reading time. We call it partner reading, buddy reading for younger kids, partner reading time. So reader one gets up and goes, gets the folder. And then um, we train them how to get the folder and how to do partner reading and error correction. The second day, we introduced paragraph shrinking. Again, we practice going get the folders. So we practice getting the folders the second day. They should be able to get the folders and sit down in like 30 seconds without hurrying or running. So we practice that even in middle school, we practice this, even with the eighth graders. Second day, we practice getting the folders one more time. Then we teach the kids how to do paragraph shrinking. And then they're, then they're up and running the whole part of reading paragraph shrinking. They don't do paragraph shrinking until the second day. But even on days three through 10, we still model paragraph shrinking, here's my scientific criterion, until the kids get it. So when you see the kids start to really pick it up, you can stop modeling it. But it'll take you two or three, well, two or three times to model it for sure. So day one, we did error, cor we show them how to get their, get, get their folders, show them how to do partner reading, error correction. Day two, we show them how to do paragraph shrinking. Then they're basically up and running days three through 10. I'll come back to that 10 day in just a minute. Anytime a kid makes a mistake, they do standard error, error correction. The, good, the reader says, stop. That word is house. What word is it? The kid says house. Good job. Now go back and read that line again. We teach the kids how to do this. If neither kid, remember, this is at reader two's instructional level. Reader one should be able to read it, no problem. Reader one reads it first, so it's modeled. So reader two has seen all the words modeled. They should be able to read it. It's at their instructional level anyway. But if there's still a word they don't know, we teach the students to error correction. If neither student knows the word, they raise their hand, the teacher comes around, and the teacher still does, the teacher does error correction, but still does this standard approach. Again, we choose the lower level, read, the lower reader's level text, reader two's level text. We, I tried using books. It's a, been a disaster every single time, except for first grade. Because first grade, sometimes those books are really small, so you can put some books in there. But anytime you have a kids go pick books as part of this, it's just a disaster. You gotta put the books in the folder. So if they're small as little first grade books, that works. Otherwise, reading A to Z and um, uh, or readworks.org works the best. So again, I don't mention I, I, those, that 10 days is not, is by accident. So what, what, we had, what happened was we went to the teachers and said, okay, will you guys try this? And the teachers, half the teachers said, sure, we'll give this a shot. For, and we said, just do it for 10 days. Give us two weeks. Do it for two weeks, 10 school days. And after 10 school days, we'll come back, assess the kids. We'll talk to you, see what worked, what didn't work, and we'll make some changes. We're just, we were just piloting this. We gave them 10 days. And they said, sure, we'll try it for 10 days. So this is the first class we did in the second grade classroom. Again, remember all those kids that were below. The median was 87. There were 12 kids below. But now look and see how many kids are below 91. One, two, three four, five. What's 20% of 23? Well, 4.6, I run up to five. We talk about 20%, 80% being proficient, 20% needing help, and that's rarely the case. In this classroom, 23, uh, 12 out of 23 kids, you know, almost 50% needed help. I'm sorry, more than 50% needed help. After our two 10-day intervention, the number of kids who needed help went down to roughly 20%, and the class median went from 87 to 113. So then we started replicating that over and over again. And uh, for time's sake, I'm not gonna show you a lot of the data, but I can, can tell you we consistently saw those types of changes. We saw class meetings that went way up and the number of kids who need help consistently going down from 10, 12 to five, to roughly 20%, just in 10 school days. So that's when we started 10, this 10 school day idea. Now, with this was in uh, first through th um, third grade, so we expanded to fourth and fifth grade. And we, we we're working in a school in Missouri, and we're all set to go. We've set it all set up, had the folders created, everything. And the principal called me the night before, said, you can't, you can't do it. She, was, we ran, she ran to the superintendent that day, and she told the superintendent, hey, this is great. We're doing this reading intervention with all of our kids in fourth and fifth grade. And you know, Dr. Burns at the university is doing it. And the superintendent told her, no. In this school, their lowest scores, state test scores, were in science. So in this district, every intervention had to focus on science. So, okay, fine. So we went to readworks.org and we took their scope and sequence of the science curriculum and we found passages that matched the topic. Okay, so that day they were teaching, I don't know, life science, 
tornadoes or something, I don't know, whatever that would be. We, we found those that matched that particular topic. Now, sometimes the connection was pretty loose, but basically, but it was there, it was a connection. So basically all they're doing is reading text about the topic for science that day. And these were all from readworks.org. All we did was search by topic. We created a, a grade level um, science maze. So if you know what maze is, we took a passage, it omitted every fifth word and put in three, three options, a near miss, a far miss, and the right answers. The, the word that fit there, a word that could be it, and a word that clearly was not the right answer. Okay, we did the intervention for two days and kept track with a science maze. So here's what we found. This is the fourth graders, three classrooms. This is their number of maze responses they got correct. And then, see this little line right here? That's how much they're supposed to go up in two weeks based on national norms. And this is how much they actually did go up. Way exceeded the, the norm. Did a fantastic job. Look at classroom C, it was so awesome. Fifth grade, same thing. This is the baseline. Number of maze responses correct. This is how much they're supposed to go up based on national norms. And then this is how much they actually did go up. Far exceeded the norm. So huge jumps. So we've piloted this and researched this quite extensively, uh, first through fifth grade. We've also done research through eighth grade. Now for high school, we just use high school pals, which is well-researched. And for kindergarten, we tend to use kindergarten pals. Also well-researched. Once we talked to the teachers, we said, what, you know, what changes would you make? And they said, well, with older kids, I'm sorry, the fourth and fifth grade teachers, they said with older kids, you've got to consider student characteristics. You can't just do the diet. You've got to juggle kids around as needed if kids don't get along. They said, keep it at the same day, every day, uh, same time each day to build routine. Make sure the students know to read new passages. Practice that procedure to, to start a new passage once the old one's finished and move on to the next one. They said, we spent a lot of time modeling, may, uh, uh, modeling um, paragraph shrinking. They said, you should probably take some time to model, part, model partner reading too. And de definitely show them how to do maze because some of the kids they thought weren't really sure how to do that. Um, and then the teachers took what we taught them, like standard error correction and paragraph shrinking, and used that in other areas as well, like social studies. And then lastly, in, this is a um, school in New York, in Buffalo, New York, that called me a middle school and this was a, a, a school in a pretty uh, impoverished area, pretty, you know, pretty tough part of town. And so we came in and did the, the uh, interventions we just described. We made no other changes. We did partner reading, paragraph shrinking, reader to instructional level in eighth, seventh, and eighth grade, except this to sixth, seventh, eighth grade. But this time it was taught in science and social studies. So we did science, like I did science and social studies passages like we did in the fourth and fifth grade. But this was a block schedule, so every other day they did, they did science and social studies. So we had to do both. So to get it every day, we had to do both. So we did every day for three weeks. This time in middle school, we do three weeks. And this is the baseline. I'm sorry, this is control group. We had random assignment. This is the control group. So we saw the partner reading group. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the ELL students. I, I must have hit it twice. So in the control group, this is how much they went up in oral reading fluency, accuracy, their science maze and social studies maze. So they're, they, you know, the control group, nothing special. They went up, they actually went down a little bit in social studies. The, or we, the reading fluency of our kids went up from about 140 to about 155. So a nice big jump in two weeks. Accuracy was high and stayed pretty high, but look at the jump in science maze and social studies maze. So we saw a pretty big jump in reading fluency, and nice big jumps in science and social studies maze. Now, what about kids or ELL? Again, we did nothing different for these kids. We, we, I hope to someday do a study to look about how to modify this for kids who are English learners. But we saw, again, nice jumps, about, what, 95 or so to almost 215. Accuracy was a little bit lower, but, you know, still pretty high, but nice jumps in science and social studies. So even among kids who are ELL, we saw nice big growth. So today we talked about classified interventions for reading. When you see a classified need, how to run a classified intervention. And we do it K through, well, K 12th grade. The kindergarten is PALS, high school is PALS. First through eighth grade, we use partner reading paragraph shrinking and we saw huge jumps.